Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome. My name's uh, John Lilly. Um, I'm the CEO of a company called Meatspace VR. Um, that is a, a, a business um, that creates virtual reality experiences that would probably be too dangerous or impossible to achieve in real life. We're based underneath the Utilita Arena in Birmingham. But I'm also the founder of, uh, of two other companies, Game Wagon, uh, where we um, uh, allow young uh, gamers, children, to play the games that they love with the friends and family that they love, doing birthday parties. And that was really a, you can see some of the vehicles here of, of, of Game Wagon, a fleet of vehicles crammed full. It's like an Aladdin's cave of uh, uh, video game joy. Probably the easiest birthday party that a parent will ever host as well. Um, but that was really a vehicle to allow me to focus on my passion. Uh, and that is inspiring young children to create technology. And the hook for creating the soft skills as well as, as, well as the hard skills in developing our future digital citizens was their chosen area of specialization where they are all experts, video games. Each of these companies over the past, well, that, that day, the 20th of March, which will ring true in all our minds, suddenly had to be mothballed. Tough, tough year. But I always believe that you hire people that are better than yourself. One of them's here today, Tony. Uh, one of them can't be here, uh, Nikki, who both run these businesses. And we were able to pivot and go online. My business, Meetspace VR, couldn't really pivot. It's based on social interactions. It's based on people coming together and having fun physically. But Nikki and Tony were able to pivot Game Wagon and Junior Game Creators and take it online. The only thing I had left to offer during that period was my time, but also to use my existing customers. And I asked them to help us out, to buy gift cards for a future experience to help our business survive. And on the back of that, I built a bursary. The focus of that bursary was for every gift card that was purchased, it created an hour of um, uh, coding and workshop, video game creating for any child that qualified for free school meals. And it was a roaring success. And today I want to talk to you about that bursary scheme, what we do, why we do it, and also how you can help. I want you, as I introduce myself, we use this in our workshops. It's a little top trump card that children that attend and participate in our workshops fill out. And maybe you can fill one out for yourself in your own head. Um, and um, I'm, I will be asking for some audience participation during this session. So I may ask you, you know, what your most interesting fact about yourself is, or what your arch nemesis is, um, and also what defines you. I've put the telescope here as this defines me in so many ways. Um, during lockdown, I thought, oh, amateur astronomy, brilliant. And I'm always in search for new experiences because we are the sum of all of our experiences. Two problems with astronomy. One, any ideas? Today's a classic example in the UK. Cloudy. It's always cloudy. Yeah. <laughs> Two, it happens at night. I'm in bed by 9.30. I miss everything. Right? If, <laughs> if only I knew before investing in a telescope to help me uh, investigate the, uh, the, the universe as a whole. My favourite game ever, Manic Miner. Um, I'd probably just started secondary school. I did computer science at school. My mum used to buy me a magazine every week, Personal Computer Weekly, and in it was literally hundreds of lines of code that you had to type into your computer to make a game so you could play a game. And it's interesting 
when two-year-olds can use an iPad. That, to a certain extent, even though our children are growing up digital natives, the distance between creating technology and using technology has become almost more distant. And junior game creators are game creating workshops that teach the soft and hard skills of coding. We're really a, 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 a look back at that old time where you could actually spend time, invested time in creating something that you could call your very own. And then over time, you would spot patterns and you would spot bits of code that you could reuse. And that's exactly what children will do in the future if they decide to go on and study computer science. They'll ride on the shoulders of giants and use other people's code, bolt things on, and then incrementally make it better. That's what you do. Um, if I had a special power, it would be time travel. My arch nemesis is Manchester City, the noisy neighbours, but I have a great respect for Pep and what he's done. Um, interesting fact about myself, I have three children and any minute now, literally, so if, if you see me dash for the door, it's because I've had a notification on my phone, about to have twins, which makes me a dad of five. How on earth did that happen? But it does mean I'm pretty skilled in tact and diplomacy. <laughs> And coaching, to a certain extent. I coached my daughter in football until I suddenly realised, actually, she was far better than I ever was. She does things with a football that I could only ever have dreamed of. Um, what do I want to get out today? I, uh, we're going to play. We're going to play a game. We're going to make a game. We're going to learn a little bit and hopefully inspire you to go on and, and spread the message and, and help us to grow and inspire more children. Uh, diversity is so important to me. Yeah, this isn't just about the privileged and the well-off. This is about helping everybody have the opportunity to be inspired about a future career. We want to create a hobby that may become a career. Tony, his favourite game, Forza. He was actually an X, not current, no. an X number one in uh, the game Forza. Uh, not bad again. He had a special power. It'd be time control. There's a trend here. We, we don't have enough time to reach as, as many people as we'd like to reach. His arch nemesis, I'm a Manchester United fan, I'm afraid his arch nemesis is Sir Alex. Um, and uh, what does he want to achieve? Uh, spreading the word about play-based learning. Our methodology for helping inspire children is through play. There's many different ways of learning things. We feel play is the strongest for building the, the, the muscle memory and the mind memory to turn something into something they enjoy and are passionate about. So, this session, uh, you're going to become game creators. We're going to take you through. Tony's going to build it, but I'm going to get feedback from yourself. And during this session, as well as listening to me prattle on, Tony's going to be doing the real work and actually making a game that you can play. I'm going to lead you on a, on a journey of discovery. I could have titled, not, not what on earth can children learn from video games, but it could be what I've learnt watching children build video games. And also what I've seen of the environment that surrounds children as they try to create, problem solve, communicate, work in teams and share strengths amongst each other. Because some people are great at music, some people are great at art, some, some people are great at, at, at the programming and the coding. Some people are great at just making sure everybody knows what they're doing. Some people call them bossy. Yeah. The project managers of this world. And all these skills are seen in the workshops that we deliver. So I'm going to share some stories from the field. You're going to make and play a game. And we're going to discover how we can all make a difference. STEM, science, technology, engineering, maths, slowly but surely through the primary years, pre-GCSE, GCSE, A-level, university, there is a degradation in the number of people that finally get to university and finally get to the point where UK PLC can hire them to become employees and work in this country in a, in a, in a global market, a highly competitive global market. I like ROI. 
return on imagination. When I look at employing people into my business, as I'm sure you look at employing people into your business, you want creativity. I believe there's three main things that differentiate any business from being an also-ran to incredibly successful. One, marketing. Two, innovation. And thirdly, automation. And there is a massive battle going on right now for all of our future employees. And it's a case of kind of learn to create automation or be automated. Learn to innovate. Learn to work in teams. And marketing is inherent, in, inherently creative. Those, th those three things come together to ensure that UK PLC can maintain its competitive nature in a global marketplace. Anyone not played a video game? Yay, well, excellent. Three. Excellent. Okay. Played a game? Any game? Board game? Yeah. Played games? Football? Sports? Okay. Some of the things. Anyone made their own game? One, two, three. Okay, great. Good. Yeah, excellent. What tools did you use? Uh, I think it was Connect 3D. Connect 3D. You've made a game? No. no. no? Okay. Traditional yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. You made it. Um, Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine. Okay. Good. Hardcore. As I was researching this presentation, and I'll, I'll come on to it in a second, um, Silicon Spa just down the road. Over two and a half thousand video game developers. Ten percent of the video game industry based just down the road. We developed a video game canvas, the JGC Game Canvas. <laughs> we saw an interesting thing. When we went to deliver our workshops inside of primary schools, um, the girls were brilliant planners. Do you know where the boys' plan was? It's in my head. It's in my head. Okay, Girls, brilliant. Pens, coloured pens out, creating a plan. This is what we're going to do. This is the characters. These are the stories. Yeah, the boy, it's in my head. Yeah, it's going to be an alien. There's going to be bombs, probably a zombie, and that's about it. <laughs> um, whereas the girls are amazingly creative. I, I, we, we, we've had um, Donald Trump running around a map of America, collecting votes whilst being chased by Mexico. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's just an amazing idea for a game. And we should never put a basket over that creative spirit and imagination. Okay? So, I'm going to ask you for some feedback here. The world. Tony's going to make the game. Give me some ideas for the world. Where's it going to be based? The moon. The moon, like that one. In a, in a forest being destroyed, okay, yeah, so uh, Amazonian jungle, like that one too. Any others? Coventry. Co Coventry? <laughs> in the piccolo tent. Which ones you want? I'm going the moon. He's going the moon, okay, well done. That's my astrology bent, twisted his arm there. But great ideas. Um, who's our main protagonist, our hero? Me. You, what's your name? Nick. Nick. Nick, what could, could be? Give me an interesting fact about yourself. I'm a drag queen. Per perfect, good. You got that one? There we are. The yeah. Superb. I think you're in the right place. <laughs> Any other protagonists? Boris Johnson we had? Boris yeah. Johnson. We've got Boris Johnson as a protagonist. Okay. Any others? Godiva. Lady, Lady Godiva. And it Gareth Southgate, who do you want? I'm going Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson, okay. I can feel, I can feel some enemies coming. Okay, I can feel some enemies. So we're going we're gonna to build a, essentially a platformer, okay? Tony's going to use a tool here. It's called Construct. It's a, it's, it, there's free versions. You don't have to pay anything to get in here and make, and make this. And 
In our workshops, we start with a tool called Scratch, then we go to Construct, and then we go to something called Core, which is relatively new. You may have come across it. Scratch is great for getting children started understanding core programming principles. But it actually gets really, really, <laughs> here we go. It gets really, really hard, really, really quickly to create a game that they know is good because they're experts. They know what good gameplay feels like, what it looks like. So we actually find now that in the same way that I think when we were all growing up, we kind of had death by PowerPoint. Now people are having, children are having kind of death by scratch. So we had to find something else to continue to inspire them. And they very quickly get to the point where they can make some saleable games, I mean, real games. And then, all of a sudden, you start with a 2D game, and it's not long before they say, hang on a minute, I want 3D. And our, our job is not to know all the answers. Our job is to coach and assist and help them discover, investigate, and make really cool games. Because what they're actually learning is a way of thinking, a way of creating projects, and something they can be proud of. So I'm going to come back to this in a minute, and we'll add some more bits and pieces as Boris comes together. Who's that? Mario. Sorry? Mario. Mario. No. Jumpman. Jumpman. Who said that? Well done. Which game? Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong. What nationality? Well, Japanese. <laughs> he, be he became Super Mario, right? But that, it started off as Jumpman. What nationality is Super Mario? Italian. Italian. What, what does he do for a job? Plumber. He's a plumber. What's his girlfriend? Peach, Princess Peach. Hang on a minute. This is a video game character, and we know an entire backstory. Yeah, and a global brand that generations can relate to. So sometimes I say, who's played a, a video game? And people go, yeah, I played a video game. Do you self-identify as a gamer? No, that's okay. We use video games as a hook to encourage children to get through what can become some pretty laborious learning if you're not vested in the project. Who's that? Notch, gamer tag. Real name Marcus Pearson. Pearson. Still know what he did? He made Minecraft. He left King, where he was working on Candy Crush, just before Candy Crush went boom. Could have been the worst decision of his life, but it wasn't. Sold Minecraft to Microsoft for 2.5 billion. And inside of his Beverly Hills mansion, he has built a candy shop. <laughs> Who are these two? Anyone? Oh, but, the Darling Brothers, the founders of Codemasters, based in Leamington Spa. <coughs> Sorry? Uh, recently sold their business to EA for 1.2 billion. That picture was taken at the same time I was typing in hundreds and hundreds of lines of code from PCW, Personal Computer Weekly. Difference probably was they were better than me and I wanted to work for the Forestry Commission. Some, <laughs> something went wrong somewhere, okay. What makes a great game? Give me some ideas of what makes, it doesn't matter, it could be a board game. It could be a video game. It could be a sport. What makes a great game? Something to lose. Something to lose, an, obje an objective, yeah. A feeling of, you know, overcoming, winning, losing, good, like that. Sorry? The environment, the environment, yes. Yeah, yeah, so the, the graphics, the, the, the atmosphere, the aesthetics, yeah, good. Anything else? Sorry? I have to admit, I'm deaf. 
progression. Yeah, so feed, feedback. You get something for investing time in developing your skills. Sounds like the kind of thing you'd want in your real life job, isn't it? You know, you're investing time, you're achieving stuff, you get feedback, you get better, you move on. Yeah. How's Boris doing? He's on the moon. <laughs> oh, he's gone. A mission, good. Ah, oh, a story, storytelling. The protagonist coming to a point in their lives where they're trying to achieve something and overcome something. Yeah, the graphics, the sound, the music, the animation, the gameplay, how it feels. Some intangibles as well as tangibles. Video game development is innately creative. How are we doing? Okay. Coming together? We need some enemies. So we've got, we've got a hero. Or is, is Boris the enemy? I don't know. We've got a hero. Who are the enemies? Greta Thunberg. Sorry? Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg. Yeah, Cummings has to be in there. Get, get Cummings in there. He's, he's got to be in there. Any other enemies? Corbin. A chair. Sue, sorry? A chair. I'm doing like a chair. A chair is an enemy. A zip wire. A zip wire. <laughs> Mauritius. So can you build some enemies in for me? Okay, how is he going to score points? We've got we've to have, have some kind of scoring. What, we, what can he collect? Votes? Donations. Donations. Let's have collecting donations, please. Okay, good. So we, 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 we're getting there, okay? Somehow, Boris Johnson's got to the moon. He's got to collect donations whilst dodging chairs. We, we're getting there, okay? It's good. I, I borrowed this quote uh, from a company um, called KSI, um, a, a group of schools, international schools. When I come home and you ask, what did you do today? Don't frown when I say play. I may be a system engineer someday. One of the best gifts I've ever given to my children, cardboard box, some building blocks, and they play. Children love to imagine, to build, to destroy, to rebuild. And somehow, if you're not careful, you can beat that out of people. We don't want to do that. We want to encourage it. Everybody, not based on where they live or how much money they've got. We want every single child, as they grow up, to be able to learn through play and have fun and create a hobby in building things. Now, when I was beavering away on my ZX81 and my ZX Spectrum and the Darling Brothers were better at it than I was, the, the job I do now, facilitating virtual reality experiences, didn't exist. The tools that I used to do that didn't exist. It's no wonder, and it's very unlikely, that that's going to change for our children. So constantly I'm called by parents saying, so when are you going to teach my child Python? When are you going to teach them Java and JavaScript? When, 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 are, they do, when are they going to do some real code? And I kind of say, I'm not. They've got years of fun to have before I make them write lines. I must work very hard. I must work very hard. Most of them can't type yet because they've kind of grown up using tablets. So I don't, when they can only type sort of 10 words an hour, I don't necessarily want to say, right, type all this code out. You've got to develop a way of thinking before you get there. You have to have build, built a passion. You have to have built a desire and a hobby before then they go through that learning curve and then typing the code will become easy. So we delay it. Who knows whether anyone will type code? Maybe it'll, code and applications will be developed through AI. Um, we've got to learn to automate 
otherwise you need to prepare to be automated. And the beauty about creative skills and being creative with the projects you're working on is it's really hard to automate creativity. And I believe that's a big focus for future careers. I want staff, I hire staff because they are creative. They problem solve, they work together as a team. The soft skills are as important as the hard skills. And I'm, I've already mentioned marketing, innovation, automation, absolutely critical skills. And during our workshops, children develop those soft skills as well as the hard skills. <laughs> Greta's winning. Well done, Greta. Okay, so he's coming along nicely, building in the enemies as we go. So we've got a hero, we've got some enemies, we know what the goal is, we've got the gameplay coming. Can you, people say, well, what, what, do, what can you learn from a video? Can you go back to your, your, your Boris guy? So inside of this tool, you have objects. Boris is an object. That object has properties, x, y, coordinates. They also have behaviors, things like gravity, and whether it's solid or not. And all those principles follow right the way through to university level programming and coding. But you're learning them in a fun way, without getting bogged down in, have I got the semicolon, the bracket in the right place? Can you make him jump a little higher? Can you just adjust? So if we want to adjust how high and, and how Boris moves in here. We've got a, a maximum speed property that we can adjust. And if we can adjust that by typing the numbers here, we could also adjust it programmatically if a certain event happened. So all of a sudden we're teaching functional programming, object-orientated programming, in a fun and interesting way, without getting bogged down in the theory. Okay? Um, who's the target audience? I'm going to give you this one. The target audience for this game is you. Okay? So it can be a little bit edgy if we want it to be. All right? What's the story? How on earth did Boris get to the middle? Did we send him? Yeah, we sent him there. All right. We sent Boris to the moon. I'm not sure how Greta got there. She followed him. Yeah. How do we end this story? He dies. Oh, there we go. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a story with a end. We don't know how it's going to end, but we know where it's heading. Okay. I thought he's the, he's our hero. We've got to try and help him survive. Or is the goal for him to? End. Yeah. Okay. Your story. <laughs> Normally in a story there's something apocalyptic that needs to be overcome before they then go on and be the future hero. What's the, what's the thing we've got to get over? Climate change. Say that. Climate change. Boom. There it is. Okay. You got that? Yeah, yeah. So I think now we're starting, and you're going to have different levels in it, so I can see that being built in. We've got story, we've got story. Assets, art, and sound. This was never my strongest point, but you'll be amazed when you give kids a microphone and say, can you create some music? <laughs> Amazing. Okay. The graphics and the art. There's normally somebody in the group that will whip out the felt tip pens and you'll go, oh my, oh my word. And then you can start everybody working together and saying, you're the art department, you're the sound department, you're the pro and you're the project manager. They all come together to share their skill set in pulling their games together. What we started off here initially was a minimum viable product, a term used in development globally. And we always say, don't get bogged down in the detail too early. Get the game to play with a square, a triangle, and some straight lines. And then slowly but surely, once the game works and flows and it feels right, then start adding your sprinkles. And how often do we kind of 
start heading off to the sprinkles without really thinking about what it is we're trying to design in the, in the first place. Dispelling fear. I, I, I'm a great believer that fear stands for false expectations appearing real. Children are told all the way through, this is too hard, you don't want to do this, you want to get good grades at A-level, so don't do maths and physics, it's too hard. We want our children to be confident in failing early. Iterate, test, repeat. There's no right or wrong. This is a creative process that we go through. Iterate. Change this, try that. Did it work? Get feedback. From that feedback, go back to the beginning, reiterate. A life skill. How are we looking? Yep. Let's have a little look, see how, we, see how he's playing. So, that, so, so in about 30 minutes, oh, that's a moving platform, look out. Boom, reach the world. Okay, next level. So you reach it, you go on to the next level, like that. I still want him to collect something. Pressure's on. You've got... <laughs> Pygmalion effect. Teacher thinks a student's brilliant, inspirational. A lovely boy or a lovely girl. There's a tendency to focus on that individual. Student learns more, student gets better, and that positive cycle continues. But the reverse can happen. So I've walked into schools to do one of our workshops, and the first thing that happens is I'm take, led by the arm. So a teacher walks past the door, peeks in and goes, oh, crikey. Can I just borrow you for a second? Drags me out. So, so and so at the back, you've got to watch them. In fact, your entire class, I mean, it's going to be tough. I'm sorry, I'm going, oh, blimey. Yeah. Now, I'm only seeing them an hour a week. A teacher might see them for the entire week, 30 hours a week. So I understand it can be different. Um, during my coaching with the FA, and fingers crossed that the coaching they did with me 10 years ago, and it was just grassroots coaching, but comes to fruition tomorrow, was it's their game, not ours. If a child gets bored whilst they're learning, it's not their fault. It's their game. So then what happens about 20 minutes into the session is the teacher wants to pass and goes, puts their head in, looks around, and then goes off and gets the head, and the head comes back in and goes, because these children that probably have a natural affinity to video games and, and coding and program, quite often are somewhere on the spectrum and quite often are some of the hardest kids to teach. But all of a sudden, they're vested in the project they're working on. It's their game. And all we are, all we're there to do is just facilitate and coach and say, doesn't, there's, no, there's no one way of doing it. Do, do it your way. Let's see if it works. And if it fails, it's okay. And for the first time ever, they go, you mean there's no right or wrong? I can't get it wrong. No, you can't get it wrong. All you can do is try. And all, it's an epiphany. An epiphany that motivates them to keep going. I had to get football in there somewhere. Some of you might remember this goal. This is David Beckham against Greece. And if you look on YouTube and find uh, an FA video on, about David Beckham, free kick Greece, you will see that the week before that game, he practiced this free kick 30 or 40 times. And missed many of them. But at that moment, that practice made permanent and we qualified. Many of the workshops for children to learn code are one-off events. 
you have to have a series of repetition and practice to get the muscle memory and to build the soft skills and the hard skills so that they can go on and create a hobby. And when they create a hobby, they go onto YouTube and self-learn. They go onto the internet and find stuff. They explore, they investigate, they want to make their games better and better. They go and show friends and family, they get feedback, and they get into this cycle of confidence, motivation, and desire, where they suddenly go, actually, I can do this, and I enjoy it. Without that ongoing practice, it just becomes a, a learning event. It was great, it was good, but what? Where does it go? Where does it lead? We've got a little controller now. So can, can you just think, got a little games controller that controlling Boris? Oh, we're collecting the brown envelopes. Grab, way there he goes. The level up agenda. We're about diversity, accessibility, and affordability. Every single child, primary school onwards, should have the ability to learn through play and to build the hard and soft skills so that it can be creators of technology, not just users of it. We capture the minds of tweens, preteens. Pre You've got to start early. You can teach some quite difficult concepts very early on and get them making some pretty cool stuff. We promote science, technology, engineering, and maths and the creative arts. The creativity drives innovation. There's nothing more creative in a child's mind than the games that they can make, the games that they can play. It becomes a springboard because they're interested and it continues to develop new skills, new interests, new experiences. And then ultimately, it becomes sustainable because it's a hobby. It's something they do for fun. It's not something they do because they're told to do it. We start at primary school with junior game creators, in school, online. Uh, I talked about the, um, the pandemic and how we had to pivot, we took everything online, we helped with the homeschooling. We've now developed something we can deliver globally over a series of weeks and teachers can take it and put it into their curriculums yeah, and we can help them develop it. Nobody at primary school, no teacher at primary school, it was hard enough, uh, my mother was a, a, a school teacher, she was a, a child whisperer. Um, she openly ad admit that she just had a way. And she would always talk about that it's hard enough getting children through as nice, balanced individuals that can read and write, let alone having to teach them code. But the national curriculum changed and changed in a positive way, that it has been included. But I think it's a bit of a stretch for suddenly for every single primary school teacher to suddenly be expected to teach code as well. And there's two companies, there's Junior Game Creators, which obviously I founded and biased towards, but also um, a, a company called Yuki, the uh, video game industry body, that developed a concept called the Digital Schoolhouse. Coventry College is a digital schoolhouse, and they have free sessions for primary schools to go to, and the teachers. So the teachers learn fun lesson plans to take back to the school, and the kids have a great day. But that's a still a one-off event. What we then do is come in and say, right, why don't you have an after-school club or a lunchtime club where we can appear, you know, as if by magic over video with a lesson plan and maintain that ongoing learning. Um, so we've got the digital school class, class here, teaching teachers as well as teaching the children. Secondary schools, we have something called the, uh, the, the Game Creator Academy. It's self-paced online learning using some of the tools that Tony's developing here, and then eventually gets into 3D. Um, that can be delivered with coaching support from ourselves, or it can be delivered online self-paced. That takes students from, you know, year six, year seven, right the way through to starting university. 
all of a sudden they are inherently able to understand what a functional specification is, what a minimum viable product is, how to iterate and create technology. We've already started um, with a school in Coventry as a, as a trial, Broadheath, Broadheath School, where we are going to, through July, go through a series of weeks, get feedback and prove the concept before then, signing up more schools September through to December, review it again, and then see how we can grow that on an ongoing basis. Um, because now, after COVID, we've been able to deliver it online, which makes our ability to reach a more diverse audience much easier. During, during that down period in my other business, the only thing I could really do was create the bursary and, and dedicate my time. So schools in underprivileged areas, children that qualify for free school meals through bursaries are able to experience a level of digital workshop that many other providers provide at eye-watering value that really only the privileged and the wealthy can take part in. And we want to bring that to everybody. JuniorGameCreators.co.uk is our website. There's a link on there for bursaries. If you know any industries, companies, or regions with corporate social responsibility budget, we'd love to talk to them about how we can use that budget to reach a very, very diverse range of children that should have the opportunity to learn this way. Have you finished, Tony? Oh, there it is. Yeah. So, do you, are you ready? Go on, show us. This, this is your game. Does anyone want to play it? Well, we'll only have one. Yeah, up you come. Here we go. This is, this is all on you. You ready? Oh, nice. Oh, Greta got him. So we had the jeopardy. Is he going to learn from his experience? Yes. No, oh, nice double jump. Oh, tricky one. Can he? Yay! Round of applause. So, thank you for listening. Hopefully, you enjoyed watching Tony do the real work while I just gallivanted in the front. Um, I'd like to open it up to any questions, any comments, any experiences of yourself. So, you know, I'm here to learn too. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you. I've got a quick question. I mean, the English curriculum across all subjects, including computing, including computing, is, has, over the last kind of 10 years, been refocused. Could, could you do me a favour? Could you come and use the microphone? I can shout louder. Oh, you could shout louder too, yes. Sorry. The English curriculum has been refocused over the last decade to be much more knowledge focused on the premise that you raise stand on the shoulders of giants in order to um, create ideas better and that you can't be creative until you understand a subject really well. And so my question is, how do you get kids from having fun at a superficial level, you know, doing drawing boards, building, uh, understanding how you use software, to then thinking about how they would actually um, code and do the building blocks themselves? Yeah, um, so we, we see them go through a journey. Um, when they start, they are very much programmed by us. Here is a series of tasks and a series of activities that you need to do. But it's amazing how quickly they do start, as I said when I used to type my code, spotting patterns and opening up other people's projects to see how they tackled a certain project. And they very, very quickly start using other people's ideas in their own projects. And then it is repetition. It's practice, it's practice, it's practice, it's practice. And an hour a week, 
you get to the point after 10 weeks where my job is to sit and try their projects. They're creating their own projects. They, they're just doing it. I'm there almost as, a, as a, just a facilitator and a, and a coach. Um, so they, they quickly get to that in the same way that you probably start with spelling, words, sentences, paragraphs, stories. They start to put that together in exactly the same way. But I do say, I'm not going to touch text-based coding until they're really in a situation at secondary school where there's actually a teacher there and they've got the, the soft skills of, of, of typing to actually not make it a chore. So I think practice and allowing them to experiment and allowing them to fail quickly creates their ability to yeah, create their own projects off their own back from, from a blank canvas. We developed the game canvas because without that, it's really hard for us to help them because we don't know what's in their head. Whereas if they start with the game canvas, for those that are ready, they actually, I can actually say, I can see where they're going and I can guide them. So making them plan before they just start. And I think, I think that's pretty similar to creative writing as, as it is for creative programming. Sorry, I am death. In data science, sometimes you've got a question and you go into a community and you can say, look, I've got this problem, I'm trying to solve it. And there's like a community created. Have you created a community through the schools or the network that you've established so that when kids are you know, coding or whatever stage they're at, they can go to the community forum and say, I'm trying to do this. Yeah, yeah. So um, we start with Scratch, we go into Construct, and we go on to Core. Each of those is built on a community. Each of those has projects that you can remix. Yeah, so you can go and find someone else's project, you can rename it as your own, and, and then you can customize it. We haven't built that community directly ourselves. We're riding on the shoulders of three amazing companies that have built those communities specific to their product. Yeah, but it, it could be something, we, we, we haven't done it yet. Got a couple of minutes, yeah. It's about accessibility because you're targeting children within a school meal who are very determined by the benefit system. What about you know that's a fraction of children that you know that not fall into that category that also can I think that's huge that fall under the category that into the benefit system. How are you going to solve that? Yeah, so um, we, we can't we can't we can't do that on our own. Um, which is why, I, I, in my business, this is something I'm passionate about. That's why I created a bursary. So I am creating hours that, in this case, Coventry Council can then find me a school that will use up those hours. So I need sponsors. I, you know, I need other companies that see this as, as valuable to contribute. It costs £10 per week to get a student through our eight-week programme. So... Essentially, you know, you are, you are looking at £80 per student to get them through it. Um, I continue to donate what I can to this cause, but that's kind of where we're here. I, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for an individual that I think is on the other side of this live stream, uh, Andrew Rice from uh, an investment group called Ajuvo. Um, we couldn't have afforded to be here today to present today if it wasn't for the generosity of a group that understands and believes in our mission. Yeah, so that's why I'm here, to ask for help. People might want to, the video games companies in, in the region, you know, the, the Silicon, uh, the, 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 this sort of area here. Um, old school um, a club, you know, um, young club, and then if I have a grant, can I sort of like you can deliver for us? Yes, if, if, there, is, if there is money available. What is the minimum number and what are the maximum number? Yeah, so I, I would go on, to the, go on to the juniorgamecreators.co.uk bursaries, just drop your details in there, and then we can have a conversation about that. Yeah. I think we are at time up. I, I'm, going to, I'm a fairly big target. It's because of COVID. <laughs> um, 
So if you want to just come and have a chat, do so. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day.